Hello, what is going on? I hope everybody is doing great and phenomenal. Welcome to the 14th episode of the Rumination Podcast, Holistic Health and Performance. Um, as always, we are building a nation that's branded by your motiv- by b- motivation through a simple process called cultivation. I'm your host, Rumin, and I am here today with Sammy Joe, three-time Olympic champion, two gold uh, once over, five-time world champ, two-time world championship MPV, and um, a co-founder of the CWHL, which is the Canadian Women's Hockey Hockey League. That is absolutely uh, amazing. And props for you to that dr- being the driving force of continuing to lay the foundation for future uh, women hockey. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, I really, really do appreciate. Uh, you being here. Um, So as before I kind of get continue on, I always kind of start off like a theme or a vocab kind of to lay the foundation. Um, And then we just kind of keep going on with the question. So the first thing I just um, go off is, is what does peak athletic performance mean to you? And how can it relate to anything? There's never a wrong answer. Just what does it mean to you? You know, I think peak athletic performance is defined individually in the moment. It's not only just defined by the individual, but the individual in the moment that they're in at that moment. Um, I know there's a lot of moments in there, but um, it changes. You know, um, as athletes, um, we are constantly looking for the perfect performance, but we are... um, training and tapering um, and preparing on a cycle for that performance. Um, you know, depending on the sport that you're in, that could happen that you have, that your your body and your psychology and everything is ready maybe four times a year. Other sports might just be one time a year. Um, and it all comes together in that, in that big moment and it may or may not happen. Um, so if it doesn't happen, you then tweak some of those constructs that you've created to, um, work on your nutrition, your sleep patterns, your, um, psychology, um, and your training regimen as well. You might, you might need more, you might need less of certain things. Um, coaching, everything kind of comes together in that, that one moment. And for me as a goaltender, we play three hour games. And so, Um, in those three hour games, sometimes you're on and sometimes you're off, you know, it's, it's for me, a peak athletic performance is a sustained effort over three hours. Mm -hmm. It's not just sort of a one-off as a swimmer, you know, might just need a minute of high energy perfection. Mine is over the course of a a long duration of a game. Now, what is also, um, bizarre about being a goaltender in essentially an individual sport within a team sport is I could have a terrible game and our team wins and that, you know, I did just enough for our team to win a big championship. And other times you could have your best performance you've ever put in and your team loses. So the emotions of it are different. Um, But what I try to get the message across is that regardless of whether you are at the pinnacle or not, um, every day, every moment can be the peak athletic performance of that moment. So you might be tired, you might be exhausted, you might not get much out of yourself, but knowing that you put as much effort as you could in and being proud of that and not necessarily of the results, not being too focused on the results, I think is, is very key. Um, so, you know, peak athletic performance will be so different for every athlete in every moment in every sport. Um, but that's mine. So sorry, sorry about my dogs. No, you're more than fine. You're more than fine. I, that is amazing how you say that. So goal, I feel, cause I played hockey for um, kind of all my life. And then, um, cause I'm not a goalie. Um, okay. I did, I did uh, all park board, little, little uh, leagues and then high school a little bit. Um, and it's interesting to have the relationships between the positions, whether you're defense, offense, wings, or goalie, and um, just the dynamic of how it's the perspective of being a goalie. So that's that's very unique. You say that, and you're right, 100%. It could be totally um, the relationship between the goalie did a phenomenal job, but we lost, or 
the goalie didn't do so hot, but yet we won. But that was just enough in that in that in that moment, right? So, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, and you brought up my literally my next question is, you know, what is the difference between um, training versus holistic, right? Because, um, you know, from the athletes that I've interviewed. Um, whether it's professional Olympic, they have mentioned so many times where it's not just a, a, a one dimension, right? It's that three dimension foundation that they have, the, the nutrition, sleep, um, you know, the philosophy of sport, how they study the wisdom and the psychology of, and, and the physiology. So what it, um, is for you, what is, is there a difference between uh, training versus cultivation or Well, you know, I think it depends on where you're at in your athletic pursuit and the time that you might have to be able to devote to something like that as well. Mm -hmm. As a full-time elite professional athlete, I was able to give all of my time and all of my moments to that one goal, that one pursuit. And so, yes, it, um, you know, we can all train really hard. And I don't think that at the highest level, any goalie is training more or less than me. I mean, on a given day, yes, they were, but you know, what could I do to separate myself, to get myself to that next level early on in my career? It was about looking at each one of those aspects that you mentioned. So it was everything from, um, nutrition, sports, psychology, video, you know, watching yourself. Um, that was really new because I I started on the national team in 98. So we, you know, we didn't have the advent of social media or MP3 player like you, you had to be on a Betamax re-watching over and over. So um, things like that were really new. And so I tried to stay at the, the forefront of technology. Mm-hmm. Um, nutrition was not a big deal then. And sleep patterns was not a big deal. Right. Um, and leading up to the 2002 Olympics, um, we uh, got funding from uh, various different sources, including the government with the Canadian women's national team to work with sports scientists in Calgary yes. to start to look at our, um, uh, the makeup of our bodies, you know, essentially yes. what, uh, what was going on with your blood? What was, what were the, everything that, you know, every sort of controllable, um, what was your main state and how could you maximize it? And, really individually looking at each one of those things. So um, I feel like a a lot of times we were guinea pigs, you know, you're kind of going through these different tests. We did um, uh, uh, lots of workouts in hyperbaric chambers in 2002, um, things that, you know, may or may not have affected our performance. Um, And just even little things like uh, what was your heart, your resting heart rate when you first woke up, that was, you know, that was new and different. Um, looking at a woman's menstruation cycle, which 100%. was not talked about prior to that and how that could affect you as an athlete, 100%. but that, that is you as a person, you know? So, um, then sports psychology became really huge too. And it isn't just about what you're doing on the ice, but everything else that you bring all the baggage you bring into that, into that moment. So, um, yeah, I think that it is now even harder to find differentiation because now all of these things are known about. So now every elite athlete is doing all those things I just talked about. So now how do you differentiate yourself? How do you get yourself, you know, to that next level? And um, I think in today's era, some of it is simply um, going back to the basics and getting more, more rest, you know, something as simple because there's so much that has bombarded on these athletes and on people in general, that sometimes it's just going back and having a good night's sleep or ensuring that, you know, if you're tired, you maybe don't go to work out, um, mm. things like that, that I think are, you know, simple when you think about it, but as an athlete, it's so hard because you've been told your whole life that, you know, the early bird gets the worm and, right. um, you know, you got to keep going, you got to keep pushing. And I, I don't think that that's, um, really, I think my superpower was my ability to rest and right. while others necessarily couldn't, I think that that's, it rejuvenates your body. It just, it helps with everything else and just helps you be in a good state of mind. So I am, uh, you know, all about these other kinds of whatever you can do to the, if you think it's working awesome, Mm -hmm. but if things are, are not working, going back to the basics, getting some rest, eating your fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And, um, you know, just being a regular human sometimes can refocus you and, uh, put you on the right path. 
I think people um, forget to uh, understand that your gains happen when you sleep, right? right. And, 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 yeah. and the people, and so I graduated my undergrad in exercise science, kinesiology, and um, it's, just, it's interesting to, to see the dynamics of working with athletes who, who yes, and they are just in rightfully so, train, 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 hard, 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 workout, workout, workout. Um, but I think sometimes, especially with the injuries that are happening with, with young junior athletes, um, that people forgetting that the, 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 the rest is this extreme, yeah. like whatever you do, you have to balance the, it out. Totally. The same thing in the workplace environment is it's like, you're not doing enough because you're not working hard enough. You're not, you know, you got to maximize the effort and it's all about how can we get the best from you? And the reality is sometimes you just got to take a deep breath and be like, okay, like let's, let's just uh, sit on the couch for a little bit and that be okay. You know, like I think, you know, you know what it's like to be a, an athlete and to sit sometimes is the hardest thing, but could be the best thing for you. Right. Right. hundred percent. Um, so just moving forward, you know, you, um, when you said, so when you, so you says the co-founder of the, the women's league, um, can you talk to about a little bit of that, that, um, how that started? Um, maybe how'd you get the motivation? And then, uh, what was it like trying to manifest that, that whatever that, what was required to be the co-founder of that? That's, I mean, that's amazing to be, to, you know, I'm sure the man, the process of doing that was to, to internally think about something that you wanted to do something that drove you and then manifest, you know, uh, countless hours to manifest that in, and now you're, you're that. So that's amazing. Well, I'd like to think, <laughs> I would love it if it was a great story like that. But the reality was it was done out of desperation. Uh, in 2007, uh, we played in a league. It was called it, a previous incarnation of the NWHL, so National Women's Hockey League. It's this great league. Um, I played on one of the top teams in Toronto. Uh, things were rolling along. We had just got back from the Olympics with a gold medal in Torino. And um, at that point, the owners of the individual clubs came together it was a league throughout uh, essentially um, Ontario and Quebec with a team out in Vancouver. Um, and uh, they said, We're, we've been losing a lot of money and we can't do this anymore. We need to step away from the table and refocus and come back a year from now with some new strategies. So what was the downfall, I think, of the previous league was that we had had have and have not teams. So I played for a have team that had a lot of money that had team that had players um, vying for spots on the national team, which then lent itself to other players wanting to play there. So it was this like good cycle of like great players. We had great coaching. We had lots of ice time. Not every team had that. And so um, it meant that the owners of the other teams were still putting in a lot of money without seeing much success, without being able to attract some of the top players. Um, and so anyways, uh, a lot of the top players, we all trained together because we played for the, the national team. So we right. trained during the days together and, you know, we heard this news and we thought, well, what, what do we do now? And so we kind of put together this idea that let's just create a league for a year while they're, they've stepped away. And so that's what we did. And um, we were lucky enough to get some incredible help from some business execs downtown Toronto, um, one being Michael Solomon from Birchill Equity. And what he wow. did was really create a business plan for us, help us with that. And he didn't do everything for us. He taught everything to us. And so the, um, the initial people that we had involved, luckily the route to, to elite women's hockey is through a lot of really great schools. So I had an engineering degree from Stanford. Um, others uh, had graduated from U of T, Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth. So some really high end schools, but we were young. You know, we didn't know much about the business world, but we were willing to learn. And so we all took on our own portfolios. Um, he uh, got people from Deloitte to help us with um, taxes, uh, from Tories to help us with legal. Like he just got people you know, out of the woodwork to basically create this, this business. And it was almost like a little mini MBA for us, which was awesome. Um, but it was a lot of work, you know, and it, it became, I was essentially the only one on that initial board that was a full-time hockey player. So I had time, which lent itself to me doing more of the work because I could. And 
you know, I would like to say that holistically I did this because I wanted the whole sport to grow. And I mean, that certainly that that's what came, but selfishly, I just want to play. I just yeah. wanted a place to play. And so mm -hmm. I worked really hard initially to create that and in creating that created a place for all women to be able to play at the highest level. So wow. I'm incredibly proud of the, you know, the work and effort that we all put in back then. Um, and that, you know, for me specifically, I think it was a real platform and jumpstart to what would end up being a career as an entrepreneur and in business um, that really started there, you know, all these lessons that I learned. Um, taught me a lot about sport, a lot about working together. And so the biggest difference that we created in that league, as opposed to any other league in existence up to until that time, was that we had an all for one, one for all mentality. So we had one pot, pot of money that was spread equally amongst all the teams so that every team would have the same access to coaching, the same access to training, the same access to um, medical doctors, everything so that it, we're all in an equal playing field. So that um, it made it made going into weekend games um, just that much more exciting because um, the teams were pretty even. It made for great hockey, great competition. And I think for Canadian hockey, it really elevated us to that next level because yeah. uh, we didn't have to just rely on always playing against Team USA, our main rivals, or traveling overseas to play Sweden or Finland. We could have these amazing games in Canada. And most of the teams at the time had five or six Olympians on the team spread out amongst all the teams so it was uh it was really great hockey and i i certainly learned a lot um and i wish you know looking back at it i wish i had this amazing story that you know i had this inner drive i wanted <laughs> to create something but no i simply did it because i a i had time i could and um i wanted to play <laughs> well that's what's still uh, what you're you're when you um i've heard the quote of some sort of i don't want to wreck it but if you protect your dream, your dream will protect you. Mm. Um, That's a great one. I think too, you know, as athletes, we're all inherently selfish <laughs> Yeah. because it is, you know, it's all about our body and how we're doing. And, you know, the focus is on you constantly. And so it was a, really the first time in my life that I uh, was able to think outside of that uh, platform and think about others and how to create, you know, the best thing for everybody, not yeah. just for me. So just... That was phenomenal. Thank you for your time any, uh, again. And moving forward, um, so I am uh, part director of a, uh, a, a young park board team, um, North Commons Hockey Association. And we do, uh, so we, we have all little kids up to 15U. And I'm wondering, you know, hopefully they'll be seeing this. Um, and I'm wondering, so they, I, I, I do part-time coaching with the, the 15U too. If there is some advice that you could give, you know, anywhere from eight year old to 15 year olds, um, and if they're going into the summer or spring, sorry, um, and trying to get some advice from someone like yourself on a, maybe how to get better um, or uh, what they can do over the summer. And then uh, maybe um, what they can, I just one of the skills they can cultivate just to get themselves uh, more confident. For sure. So I think I'll end with the summer one, because I think that that's sort of the most basic one. But I think any advice that I give to young hockey players and young athletes in general mm -hmm. is to attempt to be more inclusive. So to look around and to see um, maybe who isn't playing, who isn't involved in the games. And that could be somebody that's not even playing hockey at all to encourage them to play, you know, to look around and see who's not having these opportunities. How can I help them have these opportunities? And, and young kids can do this, you know, at the age of seven, eight years old, you have a knowledge of, of what is going on around you. Sometimes we just don't stop to think. So think about how can you be more inclusive within the game, then within your team, how can I be a role model or mentor to somebody else? And that doesn't mean that you have to be the coach or that you have to be a captain on the team. Right. It just means that how can you impart and share your wisdom with somebody else? So next time that they're in the dressing room or they're able to be together, um, you know, look around the dressing room and think, you know, what, what could I share with somebody else that would help them, that would uplift them? And it might just be some words of encouragement. It might be an actual skill that I can teach to somebody else. And I think for me in my career, in my, 
you know, lowest of lows and the toughest of toughest times, what has got me out of it was the fact that previously I had helped others and they helped me back. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it starts not in the tough times, it starts in the good times. And it starts in those times when you have that ability to share with others because that will come back and serve you later. And that might not serve you this year. It might serve you years to come. Those might be friends that you make for the rest of your life. And right. that's really important and really key. 100%. So I think it's about being better teammates. And you know, you can't just say, be a better teammate. I think that's a specific thing you can do is look around and think, how can I help? Um, who can I help? And what am I gonna do to uplift the people? around me in my room because it is my responsibility it's not up to them to lift me up it's up to me to lift them up so it's you know changing that mentality um but then specifically you know in today's era uh during a pandemic True. you know what can what can you do to be better what can you do um over the summer and i think it you know it's a tough predicament because every kid's in a different situation so uh what i would recommend is depending on the kind of person you are but is goal setting yes. and some yes. people some people need to set those goals before bed uh if i was to set my goals for the next day before bed i would be too excited and i would go to sleep so i don't do it that way i do it in the morning and i think about um one thing that i can do to be better as an athlete that day so that day not later because in a pandemic i think you know thinking too far in advance um, isn't going to necessarily serve you right now. Right. It's, it, you know, it's not a bad thing, but think about that day. What can you do? And for young kids, I tell them, what can you do one day to help you be better? What is one thing you can help to do your, to help your family be better? And what is one thing you can do to help your team be better? And so those are three things that some days you're going to be motivated for one and not the other two, but you just kind of, you just kind of struggle through the other two mm -hmm. and it's going to change every day. But I think having something to focus on in these times, well, for adults alike, I mean, it's not just, it's not just kids, but specifically for kids, I think, you know, it's a, it's a real uh, grind right now for a lot of athletes. Yeah. Um, and that one thing that you can be better at today could be something simple um uh like ensuring that all your equipment is ready to go to practice you know right. so that nobody has to ask you like it could be something super simple or it could be something that is getting better at shuttle run you know like i'm gonna you know it could be a big thing it could be a small thing whatever you're feeling that day and um you're gonna know your energy levels you're gonna know what you can get through that day and you know it might just be that you write a, a thank you letter to a coach that meant a lot to you you know, that's one little thing. It just helps and helps you feel better about yourself. It helps that person feel better about themselves. Um, you know, so the days that you're not necessarily feeling it, um, you know, use your service to others because yes. that'll, that'll help for sure. Wow. Um, so anyways, those are some specifics that I think are important for right now. And we can talk one day outside the pandemic about actual real things, but I think those are important right now. hundred percent, Sam. I really, I totally, Totally, uh, hundred percent agree to that. Um, do you have kids? And do you have your kid? Do you have kids? I have a five-year-old, and we take care of a five-year-old niece. Okay. So two girls, essentially. That's awesome. That's amazing. And both hate hockey. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't did, say that. They, did, you know, they'll come skating and they'll do it. But uh, my daughter loves like ballet and dance and gymnastics and all okay. the things that I I never thought I would be involved in. But right. Is, you know, bringing me outside of my box to, right. um, you know, see the, uh, see these little people as real people and 100%. not impart our own dreams and aspirations on them. It's hard. It's hard as parents to not want something for them. And, but yeah, yeah the seeing their passion in their eyes for something that they love is so much better than forcing them. I mean, I still force her to do things, of course. <laughs> but of course. You know, swimming and skating, I think, are two keys that I think every kid should know how to do. Yep. Uh, but when I see her do gymnastics or do ballet, like the smiles are endless. So oh, it's fun to see. That's awesome. I know that um, speaking about ballet, I know ballet is um, I want to be I don't want to say anything wrong, but I'm pretty sure I think um, one of my biomechanics professors said ballet is one of the most transferable skills 
uh, that mm-hmm. cross trains. I can um, see that for sure. Um, and NF- NFL, NHL, it is the, the, the amount of NBA players, NHL players, and uh, NFL players do a lot of ballet. Yeah, so. I could see that. And just the the strength, the proprioception that you gain, oh, just yes. everything is just so uh, phenomenal to see, even at just a young age, to see it. Um, something that I wish I would have done. Um, I just did, never wanted to wear the tutu, but <laughs> she <laughs> right. does. 100%. I totally understand. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk we're going to move into kind of the more in the competitive pressure uh, moments um and then we'll wrap it up but we're more than halfway through sorry you're you're good you're more we're, we're, we're more than halfway through uh so again sam thank you so much for your time um so let's talk about competitive pressure uh what um how to sustain not just attain right uh sustained performance under mental pressure of competition um how does someone go about that right so like for you um obviously you're a goalie um and you I, I don't know too much about the goalie but I do know enough science that it's it draws a lot of neuromuscular development right it's a lot of proprioceptors a lot of balance coordination um and being able to see stimuli uh adapt and then execute well under pressure. Um, talk about, are there uh, ways that you train differently um, versus the other, obviously, I mean, of course you're goalie, but what in your eyes do you do? A couple of tangible nuggets um, as a goalie when it comes down to being able to train or cultivate um, for that competitive pressure for peak athletic performance. Yeah, so great question. And you're right that as goalies, it is it is a different sport. So breaking down the sport um, into what will be needed in those peak performance moments, I think is really key. Um, goalie, being a goalie is very technical um, and you can get really bogged down in uh, technique as, goal, as a goalie. Um, and it certainly is very important. However, being able to execute technique uh, under duress is very different than being able to do it in a game, right? As, as you know. And so how do you replicate that? I think is, is very key for me. Um, I always tended to gravitate towards drills that were more game-like, um, and, uh, practiced in those moments as if it was a game, you know, mm-hmm. tried to bring out my competitive juices and energies so that I was, um, replicating in my mind those moments that were about to happen in real games um i think you know there there is what makes a a a great goalie two things one is the ability to stop a puck Mm -hmm. the other is the ability to get over uh the fact that you just let a goal in because we let goals in all the time i mean that's that's part of what uh makes makes goaltending goaltending so how do you stop a puck you know i if I stepped into an NHL game, I could probably stop, you know, six or seven pucks out of 10, you know, I just have that strength and skill, maybe even eight probably Mm -hmm. because I, you know, I have, I've played at a high enough level. Um, but that is not a very good save percentage for the NHL. Eight out of 10 pucks is not very good. Um, now a little kid could probably, you know, a 16 year old Bantam, uh, player could probably step into the net and probably stop six of 10. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you get to the point where you're stopping 10 of 10? Well, you need to be in those moments. You need to, um, you know, play at that level at that speed continuously. Um, and that could be finding the right speed too. I think as goaltenders, um, if you ever play too much above where you actually play competitively, it can be hard. It's hard to come down. It's hard mm. to come down to a, a, a slower speed. And it's hard to move up to a quicker speed. So you have to um, practice in those moments that are going to be similar um, to you being in the in that moment. And if you can't, you need to get um, really good at visualization. And that was yes. a big part of what I did as a goalie. I mean, the psychology of goaltending is, um, you know, they say in a practice is 20% um, mental and 80% 
physical because uh, practices are very physically demanding for a goalie. But you get to a game and they're not hard. You know, they're not right. not physically right. hard. You've done all the work. Right. I was also a competitive thrower. I threw discus and javelin. And so it lends itself um, very similarly to the same thing. You've put in all the work, you put in all the effort, but you know, you're not tired doing it. Right. The actual performance of it, it should, you should have this sort of ground, um, you know, base of all the training. Yes. Um, and then the next level is the training under duress so that you can then replicate it in big games. And um, yeah, so, I mean, we all have the ability to stop the puck. It's how, how can you do that consistently over time? Yeah. And um, that just comes down to putting yourself in, the, in those moments. So the second part is being okay with the failure. And that's not easy as an athlete. There's not too many sports that are like that high jump and pole vault are like that um you know where you're failing a lot right um we we have to deal with that so i can generally tell at a young age whether a goalie is going to have quote unquote what it takes to be a goalie because you can just see in their demeanor if they get too mad or too angry or too upset um it's going to be hard to, to continuously be in that state of mind they're they're just not going to like it after a time Right. Whereas, you know, there's some things you can do to get from, um, you know, 80% to hundred percent. But if you're starting at 20% of, um, the ability to deal with failure, that's tough. Yeah. But if you're at that 80%, how do you get to the hundred percent? Um, for me personally, um, you know, it's knowing yourself, knowing how you react to these situations. I journaled a lot post game. So what I would tell myself during the game, cause that game is three hours. So, um, some goalies will deal with the failure during the game. And I don't think you can, there's not time you you have to focus on the next puck. So for me, it was always about focusing on the next puck. You can see the goalies that are dealing with it at the moment, generally let the next goal in two, three goals going very quickly on those types of goalies. So I always said I was going to deal with the emotions later, mm. uh, deal with the, you know, whether it was a good goal or a bad goal. It doesn't matter at that moment you're focused on the next puck and you have to want the next puck right. sometimes you shy away from it you have to want it to come to you to prove to yourself that you can save it and you can like get back in the game right and so then after the game i was quite hard on myself i would uh, journal and i would often beat myself up over the goals um and it would be you know tough games hard games were tough for me to get over uh, but at least i wasn't doing it during the game um, so, you know, I, I was very technically minded and I, I wanted to know exact, I never thought there was a good goal. I always felt like I should have had it. Um, but at least I could deal with that after, you know, put the emotions aside and deal with those later and journaling really helped me just to get it down on paper. Um, I would describe each goal. And in fact, um, I recently published a book about my time on the national team and, um, every single one of those goal descriptions really helped because I could then write about it later on and write about my feelings too, about how I felt in that moment and, um, be able to kind of look back. Hindsight is always 2020, 20, but, um, yeah. So I think specifically, you know, you ask for like two nuggets. I think it's, um, I think journaling as a, as a, technical athlete is so key. And I learned that in track and field because track and field does a ton of that um, because it's the minutia of the details that is going to get you to the next level. And so that's what helped me in goaltending. Yep. So journaling. Um, and then the psychology of parking the emotions that just happened and dealing with them at another moment, not at that moment, thinking about the next puck. Wow. You couple th hundred percent uh there's a couple things you said but before we said that or go into that um please announce your book uh i know you you just got done publishing a book so please announce it so people can uh on my podcast if they're interested for sure order. so it's called the role i played and it's um subtitled canada's greatest olympic hockey team and it's about my 10 years playing on the national team um and essentially uh why canada um, won four straight Olympic gold medals, um, wow. and why I think we were successful. Um, so it obviously is my journey through that, but I share a lot about my teammates and uh, why I think I was pretty lucky to play with these incredible women and share some of their stories and, um, why this team I think was so successful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, the podcast, my audience, uh, if you're interested, please order the book. 
but a couple of things uh, you said, and then we'll wrap it up. Is I think when you were you were talking about, um, you know, how do you train for those distress moments? Um, and I think training in in, in in exercise science we call it training specificity. Um, so when you're whether it's visualization um, or when you're trying to work on motor development, you you know you think about what your mask feels like, what the mouth guard feels like, how cold it is in the rink. You smell uh, some goofball in the stands uh, eating popcorn. It's all mm-hmm. the centralizations, the, the five senses you put into your, your visualizations or whatever you're trying to cultivate in that moment. So when come game time, when the, when, when the whistle blows or the, when the gun goes off, you're ready. And then uh, another thing you talked about is um, how to be able to bounce back extremely fast, uh, parking your emotions. I think that, I don't think that people understand the, the importance on like that takes, that takes an art form essentially, you know, being able to um, bounce for bounce back from that adverse stimuli from that adverse situation that just happened. And, you know, it's one thing to, to get mad, but it's, it's another thing to to deal with your emotions and then to move forward. That is, that's hard. Like that is Well, I think, you know, for some people are just more easygoing that way and are not Mm -hmm. hard on themselves. But for those of us that are hard on ourselves, it's, it is, it is difficult. And you're, you're so right that that's the, that is a skill and a learned skill. Um, So, uh, you know, if, if in a game, it doesn't always happen, you know, don't be too hard on yourself because it is something that you can practice time over time over time. Um, and be okay about just, you know, grieving it later. Um, that's okay. Being there for your teammates, being there for the game, um, at that moment is important. And then if you need to deal with it later, deal with it later. Um, because we all have to grieve in our own way and, you know, goals are like that. Um, goals, I say goals, like actual hockey goals that scored, got scored on you are like that when they go in, you know, there, there's grief that goes along with it. There's failure. There's this, uh, there's this feeling you let people down. There's all those emotions. Right. Um, but being able to park it and deal with it later, I think is, is a skill. Like you said that you, you learn over time. hundred percent. Well, before we, we close out, I, again, I want to quickly say thank you so much for your time, Sammy, Joe, three-time Olympic champion, five-time world champion, two-time world champion MVP and a Stanford graduate. Wow. That is quite the resume. Um, again, thank you for your time. And actually one, um, I, w- I would love to, I know I've looked at the video, uh, multiple times cause it's amazing, but the story of when you were seven or eight years old, when you were playing and, and that guy in the fa- and the guy in the stands yelled that if you could, um, kind of just share that story, uh, and cause I know a lot of my audience are, uh, guys and female athletes, but you know, so for the guys, what they can do not to do actually. And then for female as being a female athlete, like how that is empowering, how you took that and you kept going. Um, but if you could just share that quick, quick little story, sure. and then so we'll I'll get quickly out of here. synopsize it that, um, you know, I played hockey at a time where it was really unacceptable for young girls to be playing hockey. But I had two parents that were not in the hockey world and didn't really initially get that, but realized that they had to shield and protect me from a lot of these negative comments that were circulating around me. So they took most of the brunt and and grief. And when I was seven or eight years old, I was in a game where I was playing forward at the time. And a man from the stands yelled down at me at the top of his lungs. Hey, little girl, you belong in the kitchen. Oh. And, you know, the way I tell the story is I didn't know if that was a place I was on the ice I was supposed to go. Like, I didn't know what that <laughs> right. meant. And I had, you know, I'd never really in, uh, encountered misogyny or mm. chauvinistic comments. I'd re- never really internalized it. So in asking my coach what it meant, he told me to ask my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my mom, you know, had to explain to her basically eight-year-old daughter that life isn't always fair. And, you know, it's a tough message, but I think it's a really important message for all of us and all of your listeners to hear is that life is not always fair and it's not meant to be fair. We're all different, dealt with uh, different cards, and especially during this pandemic, um, to be really aware of what other people are going through. Um, you know, you don't have to know what it is they're going through, but, but know that they, they come with a whole baggage behind them. 
and there's stuff going on in their lives you're never going to know about. And um, my mom said I'd get cut from teams because I was a girl, which I did. And there, I would uh, wow. have to deal with a lot of chauvinistic comments, which I did. Um, mm. But, you know, they, she said to me, ultimately, if you love this game, um, and I did, that my dad and her would support me no matter what. Wow. And so just knowing that I had two people in my corner, I think for me made all the difference because I felt like I could um, just play. I, I felt like what I was doing uh, was right. You know, I, I, I didn't feel like it was wrong. Um, so what I tell people during my presentations, because I speak on this a lot, is that um, try to be the, that person to somebody else. You know, don't think about the little girl that was going through this, this tough time. Um, think about how you can be uh, Rod and Pat Small, those are my parents' names. How can you be that person to somebody else that just believes so strongly in somebody else and in their dreams that you uplift them and you, you know, you don't laugh at their dreams. You don't uh, ridicule them for what they're trying to do. You just simply encourage them and support them no matter what. Yeah. And so I think for both boys and girls, that's a really important message to look around and think, how can I uplift those around me? Yeah. Um, because everybody is going through tough things in their lives. And, you know, there still exists a lot of gender inequities in our, in our world, but not as many as there was. And so this, that story is not as prevalent as it once was. Uh, but when it comes to um, race, background, sexual orientations, there are still a ton of discrepancies that happen. Um, and so I think as, as the person going through it, you can take it two ways. One is, um, you know, it can force you to leave the sport or the activity, whatever it is. And, you know, that certainly happens to a lot of people. Um, or you can attempt as best you can um, to find people who believe in what you're doing. And, you know, it might not be your parents because, you know, not everybody has that luxury of, of having parents with foresight, like what my parents had. Right. So I get that. So if you don't have that, Try to find that in a, in a teacher, in a coach, in, yes. in a peer, even a peer that, you know, can share in, in the ups and downs, your struggles. Um, so you don't feel like you're just an island in the middle of this other world, you know, right. but that you have others that are, are, have either gone through or sharing or are listening to what you're going through. So I think that that's really key. And um, especially in, you know, during the times we're going through now, being able to reach out to others, um, to not be shy about it, but people want to help. People just don't always know how, you right. know, so let them know how they can help you. hundred uh, percent. There you have it, folks. Uh, unconditional love at its finest, like for real. Yeah. That, that is the bedrock of That's true. Uh, mm -hmm. the unconditional love. Uh, so thank you again, Sammy Joe. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the podcast and I appreciate you and you appreciate the time. Well, thank you, Ruben. I really appreciate you reaching out and I'm glad we finally got this done. I know, right? Thank you so much. All right, take care. Take care.